Hello, everyone. I hope that everyone is doing great. And I have a special, very special um, surprise for you because soon enough, hopefully, in the house will be Dr. Douglas Graham. Here is the man. Here he is. So now he's going to join us. He's going to join us and we are going to talk about very intriguing subject. Hello everyone on YouTube. I hope that everyone is doing great there as well. So it seems like that I cannot, the Dr. Douglas Graham cannot join me on YouTube. So we are joined on Instagram and you can go either to my Instagram profile, Health Glows, and watch this live. It's going to be amazing. We're going to talk about very intriguing uh, topics on the topic of supervised water fast. But if you want to stay here on YouTube, you can also do that. And I'll be more than happy to um, to ask your questions that you can uh, just give, uh, just uh, put me here in the comment section, in the chat section. And I'll be more than happy to ask Dr. Douglas Graham on Instagram. But we are on Instagram, it seems. I did send him the link, but it seems like I don't have an option to go live with someone on Instagram yet on my YouTube channel. So we'll have to wait for that feature in the future. And now <laughs> I see uh, some my uh, some of my dear uh, one of my dear friends already already has a very good question for Dr. Douglas Graham. Don't worry, Radomir. Your question is here in my file, and I'll uh, I'll be more than happy to ask Dr. Douglas Graham uh, your question. Actually, I already sent him uh, questions. Uh, for those of you who did not get a chance uh, to ask questions in advance, I'll just uh, quickly explain how this works. So um, Dr. Douglas Graham and I are organizing a supervised water fast this coming June, starting on the 15th of June in Serbia. And we already have some people who registered for our water fast and they... Uh, uh, I mean, logically got um, a chance to ask the questions first. So I have a file in which I collected all the questions of people who are going to fast. And now Dr. Douglas Graham is going to be so generous with his knowledge as always uh, to share um, his explanations with us. Uh, let me just briefly introduce Dr. Douglas Graham. Dr. Douglas Graham is a walking encyclopedia of knowledge on health and diet and whatnot, like just ask him, you name it, and he'll just go on like encyclopedia and talk about it. So mm, that's true. That's true. Um, and especially when it comes to fasting, because this man has experience of 40 years of running supervised water fast. Is that right, Doug? That's more than right. Yeah. Since the early 80s. Nice, nice. Before I was born. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, like it's good. Like you have all these experiences. That's amazingly amazing. Yeah, the first ones are 1982. Okay. Wow. Yeah, started started then, so it's been more than 40 years. More than 40 years running a supervised water fast. Why would anyone want not to eat for a period of time? Well, it could be a variety of reasons why a person would not want to eat. Uh, perhaps you're tired and want to go to bed, and go to sleep, and, and you're more sleepy than you are hungry. Um, or you feel very energetic and you want to go do something uh, instead of eat. Maybe you feel like you want to go play golf all afternoon or, or go for a bicycle ride or, or garden for a long time. Um, these are short periods of time when you might not. Um, perhaps you have an illness, an acute illness. You have a, a cold, as they call it, or you have a flu, or or you have an infection, or you have something that makes you feel badly. Uh, you have fever. Um, typically, the body shuts down your appetite at these periods of time. You really don't feel hungry at all. Um, you know, when you feel ill. So 
these are, again, as I say, short-term reasons, but why would anyone choose to fast? Well, typically it's because they want something. Typically they want something. And they want something to be better than it currently is. Now that might be, a, they might be having a, a chronic health problem. Um, you know, they may be having arthritis or heart disease or any of a thousand chronic health problems that could be going on. Uh, and they've already tried everything. They feel like they've tried everything else. And so it's time to, you know, time to try one more thing because when you've lost your health, you have to keep looking for it. I mean, you can't just give up. Uh, but then there's people who feel really well. They're on top of their game. They're, they're athletes or they're performers or they're artists or they're musicians. Um, and they want to be even better. They want to improve. So we'll talk about how fasting makes this happen in a little bit. But, um, you know, these are people who might be willing to say, you know what, if, if, if at the end of the day, when I really can't do anything productive anymore, I've really like reached the end of my day. Uh, if I can go to bed and rest for eight hours and wake up the next morning with enough energy to go through a whole day again, I mean, that's a pretty big gain from eight hours of rest to be able to do another 16 hours of, of effort when, you know, you really probably went to bed, you were good for maybe another 10 minutes is all you had left. <laughs> As the old expression goes, from can till can't, that's the kind of day we like to put in, from can till can't. And just imagine if we can gain that much overnight, how much life we can gain by taking a bigger period of rest and fasting. Most people think fasting means not eating, but that's really not what it's about. Uh, yes. When we eat, we certainly begin to break a fast, but fasting is actually a form of resting that's deeper than any other known form of rest because it's accumulation of various types of rest. So we have physical rest. You know, if you want to get if you want to get a good night's sleep, you don't you don't wake up every hour and do push-ups. We actually just completely stop all physical activity, and that's physical rest. But we do this when we fast as well. But we also um, do what's called sensory rest, and sensory rest means that we're we're in an environment where we're comfortable. Uh, perhaps when you look out the window, you see green or you see a body of water, or you hear birds, or it's a comfortable temperature, or you don't hear construction noise, or you don't hear automobiles, or you're not being, um, you're not being assaulted by bad smells or awful sounds or things of this sort. So you get into a sensory, comfortable position, which usually means it's rural. Uh, usually means it's green, usually means there's at least a little bit of a view, some kind of a view involved, and there's, you feel surrounded, um, surrounded by nature, but not enclosed, you know, you're, you don't get claustrophobic, but, but this sensory rest is just as important uh, as any other kind of rest, and when you start adding different rests together, you get into a deeper rest, so... Uh, we can also have what's called emotional rest. And in, with emotional rest, you, you leave your worries behind. You let someone else take care of things for a while. Uh, you trust that, for instance, in a medical facility, if you're in a hospital, we trust that the doctors and nurses will do the worrying for you. And they're checking up on things. And they're making sure that to the best of their ability, you're not getting into a dangerous situation. You let them worry uh, what your blood work says or what your lab work comes out or how your recovery is going. Uh, and and with, with emotional rest uh, added to the other two, you're starting to get into a much deeper form of rest, which is why 
you know, hospital food takes, um, a lot of people make fun of hospital food. Some people say it's, a, it's an oxymoron to even say hospital food, but, um, hospital food takes, takes a lot of beating and perhaps it's well-deserved, but it takes a lot of beating. Uh, and yet in spite of hospital food, most people who go to the hospital get well in spite of it, certainly not because of it. And so this demonstrates the power of the other three types of rest of physical rest and sensory rest and emotional rest that you can just go into a hospital rest as deeply as possible while still eating um, hospital food while still being assaulted by drugs and medicines and poisons and goodness knows what being probed and woken up to see if you've taken your medications and goodness knows what right uh, when we add a fourth type of rest which is called physiologic rest this is when we actually intentionally shut down the digestive system. We give it a complete shutdown. We let it stop. And this takes some days for most people and weeks for some others, depending on the health problem. Somebody with ulcerative colitis, um, somebody with Crohn's disease, these people could take three or four weeks before the digestive system will finally even shut down. So once it does shut down, A, you get into a yet deeper state of rest. But B, you also have now set the stage for the digestive system to heal itself, which it simply barely can do while you're eating two or three or four meals a day, the digestive system's always in use. Imagine trying to fix a road without stopping the traffic on the road. It would be really hard to repair a road, you know, um, while the traffic just keeps whizzing by. So uh, the same thing here, if we can get into those deeper states of rest, interesting things happen chemically and more and more medical science is catching up to what the hygiene movement has been all about for 150 years of teaching people that when we rest in the deepest form of rest, this is when the body does its most powerful healing. This is when it does its most efficient recovery. It's, it's such a powerful effect by getting into a deep rest that for most people, it actually looks as though we're turning back the clock almost one year per day of fasting. So, and I can show you before and after pictures sometime. I uh, don't have a slideshow set up right this minute, but we have slideshows of people who fasted for 20 and 30 days before and after shots where they truly look like they've lost 20 to 30 years off the look of their face where their eyes open up and their and their features become um less swollen you know more pronounced clear features the skin becomes like porcelain instead of big pores but just all sorts of wonderfulness happens we, we start to see chiseled men and and really just youthful looking women who look you know decades younger than they did before the fast it's it's quite phenomenal that they you know they say your face tells all right so uh it doesn't tell everything but it tells an awful lot and if you can make Obviously, we can't turn back time, but we can allow you to heal to within your potential. People say, what can you do to live longer? And I'd say nothing. There's nothing you can do to make you live longer, but there's lots of things you can do to make you live shorter. And so the same thing with fasting. Fasting doesn't miraculously make you live longer or be smarter or um, you know, increase your physical attributes. What it does is it takes away all the things that were holding you back from reaching your full potential because your, your kidneys and liver get a chance to play catch up and they start to 
the word typically thrown around is detoxify. They, the body can detoxify itself and heal itself. While, as I alluded, some really interesting biochemistry happens. Uh, absorption of nutrients rises dramatically. And so to the degree that most people, if they do before and after B12 testing, they'll find that their B12 levels are typically higher after a fast than they were before because B12 is something we absorb, but we don't consume, all right? We manufacture, and, and if, our, if our absorption is off, then it doesn't matter how much B12 we manufacture if we can't absorb it. Uh, we, see, we see growth hormones increase. We see, we see um, <sighs> telomeres increase. Think indicators of the length of life actually increase. We see, we see um, increases in helpful free radicals over and over things happen that there's a book called the miracle of fasting and and i don't know you know when you see a newborn baby you realize what a miracle really is all about uh, but when we see someone who's been dubbed incurable they've been dubbed incurable and then they fast for 20 or 30 days and they have no more symptoms of whatever they had when they were incurable. And I've seen this hundreds of times, not just occasionally. Every person that ever came to me with a heart problem went home without one. Every person who ever came with an infection went home without one. Every person who ever came with arthritis of any kind went home without arthritis. Uh, I've seen so many different kinds of conditions uh, from, from neuropathies to you name it, every kind of digestive disturbance responds well to fasting. Because in fact, we're set up to naturally fast. Uh, a phenomenal number of the world's mammals all fast as part of their natural normal cycle of health regime um, you know whales whales fast for six and seven months at a time uh, seals fast often for six months bears fast through the winter uh, dogs and cats will not eat when they don't feel well you can't make them eat when they it's called off their feed you can't make them. It's, they know that it's the natural thing to do is to just not eat. Uh, fasting is common throughout the animal kingdom. And, and if you were to live in what we would consider to be our natural world, someplace where it's warm enough to walk around naked <clears throat> all year round, Ooh. Wouldn't that be fun? Okay, let's say it was. Uh, even then, you'll find that that jungles and and savannas and the other warm places of the world typically have a period of time of four to eight weeks every year where food is almost unavailable or it's completely unavailable. This is normal for for human beings to go through a cycle every year where we actually just wouldn't find any food for two, four, six, maybe even eight weeks, depends where you lived. This is a rejuvenescence. It, this is a, a youthing, if you will. This is, this is near miraculous to be able to turn back the clock and feel better in every way than you did before a fast because in the world of anatomy and physiology all structures and all functions vector towards health when we fast this is what allows the body to get rid of 
what are called mutagens. We get rid of mutagens. Now, mutagens are substances that prevent the body cells from perfectly reproducing themselves. And when that happens to a cell that it can't perfectly reproduce itself, our experience of that is called aging. So we age a little bit due to the effect of mutagens. So as the body rids itself of mutagens during a fast, we literally actually slow the aging process not slower than it could be, but closer to what it should be. Nice, nice. Um, thank you. And then if uh, fasting is so natural, why do people need supervision for a long fast? What does super supervision imply? Well, it's a good, it's a good question because as I, as I said, all these other creatures just fast. But they don't come into it in the same way we do. They're not coming into it with diseases. They're not fasting because they're unhealthy. They're healthy. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the most outstanding features of, of creatures from, from butterflies up, worms and butterflies and, and right on up through the animal kingdom uh, is that they're all fitter than us. <laughs> I mean, an ant can carry something 15 times its weight on its back and run the ant equivalent of a four minute mile. And none of us are hardly anybody in the world's fit enough to run a four minute mile. Very few people, a couple hundred people in the whole world have ever run. And, and, <laughs> And an ant can do that for 12 hours a day, run at that pace, carrying 15 times its own weight on its back. I mean, a human being that can lift three or four times its own weight for, you know, a few seconds, a few inches, but certainly not go run across the room. <laughs> you watch a squirrel go straight up a tree, 50, 100 meters straight up a tree. It's, it's spectacular at a sprint. Uh, you know, animals are tremendously fit. They're tremendously healthy or they don't survive. Whereas people perhaps long ago could actually fast on their own. We know many people fasted on their own in history. We hear stories of people who fasted. <clears throat> But you got to remember, everything they ate was organic. That's all there was. And everything they ate was locally grown. And they didn't stay up past dark because there wasn't any light. <laughs> they went to bed and they, and they got 8, 10, 12 hours in bed every night because it was dark and, and the, you know, there's not much you could do. So they were well rested and they weren't stressed. And, and if something happened... 12,000 miles away and there was a natural disaster 12,000 miles away. They didn't hear about it ever in their entire lifetime and hence they weren't worried or concerned. So they carried a lot less worry and a lot less concern and their earning power was far more commensurate with their work day than it is today. So we're, that's, that's before we started adding chemicals to food. Uh, People are not as healthy today as they were long ago. So for this reason, and because we're so much less in tune with our bodies, and because things do occasionally go wrong during fasts. Now, most fasts are uneventful. Most fasts just go by and nothing needs to be done. But if I have eight or 10 fasters in a group, you can pretty much be sure that every single one of them is going to have a day or two, a moment or two where their doubts or their fears or their worries or their concerns or their 
discomfort or their inability to stay in the moment, something has got them to a point where they need some reassurance. They need some guidance. So I make a deal with every faster. I make a, I make a contract right up front. I go, look, if, if you're ever in a position where I'm worried about you, I will tell you clearly that I'm worried about you. But if you're just within normal limits, <clears throat> your adrenals hurt, you know, or, or, uh, your blood pressure is a little low or a little high or something's going on. Right. Uh, if I'm not worried, I will also tell you, and I want you, I, and this is tremendously reassuring for a person who, you know, every athlete, every athlete uses at least one or more coaches, especially the pros, many coaches. Business people all use consultants. Absolutely. Could you imagine if you decided you wanted to climb Mount Everest next Thursday? I need a coach. Oh, and you're going to go on your own. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like you won't survive that trip. You simply won't survive that trip. And I've seen plenty of people do that kind of fast where they didn't survive on their own but there's more really uh there's more because the part of the fast that requires the most supervision is is coming out of the fast this is where people get into the biggest trouble the fastest make the make the worst mistakes and and this is where experience really pays off at big time so guiding people through the fast and helping them know what they need to do each day or not do is super valuable. Um, I just, I just couldn't imagine climbing a mountain without some kind of a guide. And this fasting is certainly like a, like climbing a mountain. You're going someplace you've never been, on a road you've never been, through an experience you've never done before. Uh, I built something recently. I, I built a, a wooden storage box out in my back garden. And when I finished, it came out, it came out okay. But I knew about all the mistakes I'd made and knew that if I made a second box, I'd make far fewer mistakes. And if I made a third one or a tenth one, can you imagine by the time I've made a hundred of them, like I'd be pretty good at making that wooden box and get the hinges in the right place and da 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 da, right? Um, it's the same thing with fasting. Once you've taken thousands of people through a fast, you have the medical training to know what's going on, you have the experience to be able to assess each person each day and let them know how they're doing, basically. Uh, I've got no end of enthusiasm. So education, experience, and enthusiasm, I think those are the three keys so that when the fast break comes, we start teaching people how to reintroduce foods and how to learn proper food combining and how to make friends with fruits and vegetables and how to, and how to dance through the, the intricate process of adding food and adding exercise, adding food and adding fitness over and over. Like, like one of those little puppets that climbs up two ropes um, and keeping that balance, it's easy to overtrain. It's easy to undertrain. It's easy not to know how to train. It's easy. I mean, if you want to go home with the physique of your dreams, or at least on the road to the physique of your dreams, you need somebody to show you. I mean, people get personal trainers all the time. Why not take advantage of that and learn what you're doing? 
during a fast. The other thing about doing it on your own, and, and I know I'm talking a lot here, but there's another thing about doing it on your own. If you do it on your own, you're basically going to be the same person you were at the end of the fast as you were at the beginning of the fast. But if you go through a supervised fast, at least with me, where I'm going to spend two to three hours every single day educating you about how to take better care of yourself, how the body works, how to create the physique of your dreams, how to keep your kitchen in a successful place, how to take care of food and recipes and nutrition and, and naysayers and on through the, the social aspects of dealing with being a raw fooder in a non raw food world. Uh, and you take on 80 hours of education you're a different person after 80 hours of coursework. Mm. There's no way that that you can't suck that up without it changing the way you see the world. So I make a point to spend a lot of time in education, a lot of time uh, post fast as we come out of the fast uh, in one-on-one -on -one time and personal training time, and as well as continuing the education, uh, while we work our way into a raw food feast. Nice, nice. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, this clarification on what the supervision of fasters imply. Then the next question that we got is, and this comes from someone who is concerned about if someone has um, a little bit more weight than um, than they would like, and then they lose that weight during a fast, and this person is concerned Will this will they have lose skin because they lost so much weight during the fast? Where does the skin go? Well, skin does tighten up to some degree, uh, but depending on this individual situation, let's understand how much weight we're talking about. Okay, when a person's fasting. And this is an average, okay? So it's different for a little person than it is for a really big person. But when a person is fasting, they're only using about 900 calories a day. 900 calories is not much. And it adds up to a, almost a kilo a week of fat loss. A little less, in fact than a kilo a week of fat loss. Now, yes, water weight changes before, during, and after a fast, but water weight wasn't really you anyway. This is just dilution of your, of your everything else that is you. Um, and so if a person fasts for three weeks and loses three kilos, they're not going to end up with loose skin. That isn't going to happen. You're not going to see folds and folds of skin hanging around on people after a three week fast. It doesn't happen a, because the skin does tighten up a bit, all structures and all functions vector towards health. And so skin tone improves during a fast. We also show how after a fast, what type of activities are best for toning the skin so that it can continue to tighten up a bit within its parameters to do so, within its given parameters to do so. But three kilos on most people, if you lose three kilos, Marina, we'll see it. But if a person who weighs 125 kilos loses three kilos, it's a small percentage. We can't even see it. They might not even feel it. Um, and of course, yes, they're also going to lose five or 10 kilos of water weight, but that water weight will come back after they start eating. Most of it at least will come back after they start, e start eating. And so, 
I'm not worried there. And again, that won't result in loose skin. Nice, nice. Thank you. I hope that our viewer got his answer. Uh, Radomir, please tell us if you are satisfied with this answer. And then uh, the, the next three uh, questions come from a gentleman from Serbia who is going to fast with us this coming June. And uh, his first uh, question is, is muscle mass lost during a fast? No, muscle mass is not lost during a fast any more than muscle mass is lost overnight when we rest. But what does happen is muscles do shrink when we don't use them. So this is different. This is normal, natural shrink and grow of a muscle based on usage as opposed to, oh, I'm fasting, I'm going to eat up my muscles and use them for fuel. This does not happen at all. Not one gram of muscle mass is used as fuel during a fast. Does not happen. No, no loss of muscle mass. Okay. And uh, uh, muscle volume? Well... Uh, because yes. maybe muscle volume because you will lose some fat from within the muscle but it's like marbled through the muscle surrounding around the muscle like we said you're going to lose some fat and so you'll even lose some fat in the muscly areas and so could muscle look smaller yes but as you lose body fat, especially, especially subcutaneous under the skin fat, your muscles stand out more and they look bigger. So you actually would likely look more muscular after a fast than you did before. Mm, nice. Okay, and then the next question that this gentleman that is going to fast with us in June uh, asks is, like, if mass uh, muscle mass is lost, and which is not, as we have see, heard now, he says, is there a way to prevent this muscle loss? But if, uh, like, if, if maybe the right question would be, is there anything that uh, fasters could do during a fast to prevent muscle volume? And the the answer is probably no, you should rest, right? Or well, what? first of all, first of all, fasters are trying to get into the deepest state of rest possible. Second of all, no, we're not losing muscle mass. Third of all, after the fast, we can work to gain muscle mass if that is a goal. Uh, I don't wish to gain muscle mass. I, I do wish to gain strength and I make a differentiation between the two. Um, but if a person wishes to gain muscle mass, we'll teach them the exact appropriate protocol of training that will allow for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. I think that a lot of people are not aware how little muscle they have, because if they had more muscle, it would just stand out after the fast, as you, as you mentioned, and the fast and losing uh, losing water and losing fat just shows how little muscle or no muscle they never had. But that's a whole other thing. And then they yes, people get... credit themselves for having a lot more muscle. Than yes, like and and then just eat salt and and they are bulky and think those are muscles, but that's just accumulated water and salt. Like okay, but anyway, that's called another story. And um, uh, and the next a third uh, question. In that. Yes, there is a third question from this gentleman uh, from our faster. Uh, what does Dr. Uh, Graham says about intermittent fasting in terms 60, 16 hours without food and eight hour window for meals? I think we should eat when we're hungry, first of all. I think intermittent fasting is a misnomer because now we're talking about fasting mm. and we're equating it to not eating. You're not, we're not talking about deep rest for 16 hours a day and not resting at all for the other eight. 
Uh, so we're really, if I can use the phrase, bastardizing the term and throwing fasting out when what you really meant was not eating, uh, which is a very small part of fasting. But even more, if you're hungry, why shouldn't you eat? That doesn't make any sense. If you're tired, you should sleep. If you feel energetic, you should go be active. If you need some to talk to people, you should go be social. If you're hungry, if you're thirsty, you should drink. If you're hungry, why wouldn't you? Just because we set up this arbitrary thing. Now, we have to understand where, where programs like this originate. And they originate from trying to solve a problem, a great big problem, by making little itty bitty concessions. Uh, kind of like the boy who stuck his finger in the dike. You know, the dike's about to overflow and he's got his finger in a little tiny leak. The big problem in the Western world currently is obesity. In terms of health problems, the big problem is obesity. And obesity is, there can't even be a war on obesity. Obesity already won the war. So it's a problem. And most of the things that come out in the world um, of food, nutrition, and health-related concepts have to do with can we find some stopgap measure that will help us overcome our obesity problem. So by creating a window for eating, rather than just saying, hey, eat 24 hours a day, just you know, have your fourth breakfast or whatever. Um, by creating a window, this helps people have a structure that they can follow. Now, when all is said and done in my world, the difference between intermittent fasting and eating satisfying meals is is tough to see. Same here. Yes, I do understand. I eat breakfast usually around midday. And I have so many bananas until I'm just happy. And until I know that I'm not going to be hungry again for four, five, six, seven hours, depending on what's ahead of me that day. Today, it's going to be eight hours. So I had a lot of bananas, but I didn't eat them until one o'clock. And, and by the time I get to have dinner, you know, it'll be after eight o'clock. So those eight hours, those seven hours in between, I'm not even thinking about food, not even considering food because my meal was so satisfying. Dinner's going to be the same. It's going to be very satisfying dinner. And then I won't think about food again until well into the next day. Does this count as intermittent fasting just because I ate meals that were satiating? Probably no, because I'm, because it's not an effort on my, on my behalf, right? It's not an effort on my part to make this happen. It just happens naturally. But when I was a kid, that would have been tough because I was always hungry. I was snacking constantly. And what I should have learned a lot earlier was what that told me was that my meals weren't satiating me. I can eat a huge meal and still be hungry. What did I miss? What I missed was simple carbohydrates. I missed fruit, but which is why we saved dessert till last. Our meal of dessert and be satiated. So I don't recommend the intermittent fasting protocol, nor does it bring the health results that anyone claims for it. Certainly not the health results that you can garner on an extended water fast. And here's why. 
The trip to the moon in a spaceship is 250,000 miles. And I don't know how long that takes, but let's say it takes 36 hours. I don't know how long it takes. Um, and you're in your, you're in your little geo car and you drive 20 minutes every single day. Are you ever going to get to the moon? It's not going to happen. You could go kite surfing for 20 minutes every single day. You're never going to get to the moon. In order to get 10, 15, 20 days into a fast where it can start having a momentum of its own and really take off, you've got to fast for 10, 15, 20 consecutive days. 50 one-day fasts only add up to 50 one day fasts in the first day of a fast we spend the first 18 to 24 hours utilizing the food that we ate the day before finally making use of it and clearing out whatever is left to scour out of the digestive system and then beginning to scour out what's in our muscles, which is not only glycogen, good for about eight to tw- eight to 18 hours of complete rest, but there's also plenty of fat in those muscles for most people. <laughs> and we can start to utilize that fat. And so we haven't even begun to get into those deeper states of rest that we call fasting. So intermittent fasting is just falsely named. It's misleadingly named. Uh, It doesn't give the results that fasting offers. I mean, intermittent fasting doesn't even give you the results of one day of fasting. But one day of fasting, no matter how many one day fasts you do, it'll never, ever Get you to the moon. It'll never long, get you to the moon. Long, long fast, yeah. Yes. Um, I know, Marina, you, re- you relatively recently fasted a year and a half ago or something. Yes. And, and, uh, and you can now attest to the fact that for all the one day and two day fasts that you ever did, they, are, they don't add up to what a long fast. I remember how euphoric you were. You know, those first few weeks after your fast had ended and and having gone through an experience that is nothing like 15 or 20 one day fasts. It's just not nobody. The same thing. Yes, uh, I'm going to say this. Nobody can imagine what 21 day uh, or, or any uh, long fast means and is if they don't go through it. So you can't fast for two days and then for two days. And and no matter how many uh, times you fast or short fast, it can't be the same as a long one. It is as if you're going from A to B and you come halfway through and then come back and think that going halfway through 10 times, you're going to make it somehow to the B. No, you have to go straight to the, the B and just go through it. So that's amazing. And I taught before um mistakenly and you taught me better that 21 is a magic number so when we were uh, making a program for our upcoming fast which uh, begins on the 15th of uh, june if anyone wants to have a supervised water fast you are more than welcome uh, to join our retreat in europe in the country of serbia we have beautiful accommodation uh, professional care, professional supervision, and ideal uh, conditions for your uh, absolute rest, you can join us uh, through the link that I'm leaving here. And if you are not in mood for fasting, but you would 
would like to learn about FAST and live with Dr. Douglas Graham and me and other fasters on the site for a month, eat uh, the 80 10 10 diet, exercise with us, and take care of the fasters, learn about natural hygiene, learn about diet. There is also a program for that. You can uh, DM me for that, and I'll be more than happy to send you the link. Uh, so anyway, when we were making a program for this upcoming fasting retreat, my first uh, idea was that we fast people, that people uh, fast with us for 21 days, and then they have a refeeding process for seven days. And that's where when you taught me that 21 is by no means a magical number, and that you would, wouldn't feel... Um, uh, good about having people leave comfortable things uh, having people leave so early into their refeeding process so weak as for example happened to me i went on a long plane um flight uh changing five different flights at a very low late uh weight so that that was like one of the nightmares in my life when i had to go through that uh, experience uh, changing five different flights uh, so weak. Now I'm just happy I'm alive. That, that's all I'm going to say. Yes. <laughs> I see somebody nodding his head. I guess you have a lot, lot to tell me. But anyway, that's for another occasion. And uh, yeah, tell us about 21 day magic number. How did that happen? I've never fasted anybody longer than one day. Uh, one day at a time. One day at a time. Uh, people initiate a fast on their own. Although I'll give them guidance as to when they should start. Anyone who will come with us will talk to each individual and let them know when it's appropriate for them to start the fasting part, you know, to, to stop eating, essentially. Um, and... And every day after that, I'll check with you to see if you'd like to do one more day. But people, if you will, we're saying June 15th. It's sort of arbitrary. As opposed to, wow, I've come down with a tremendous injury. Um, and, I, and I'm on a mountain and I can't get down the trail because I'm so hurt. I'm just going to lay here and fast until I get better. Uh, this is arbitrary. This is just, we're picking June 15th. Uh, in the same way, to some degree, we will choose an arbitrary ending to the fast. This is not like making fudge brownies where you say, okay, 20 minutes at 350 degrees and ping, it's done. Uh, this is an individual custom experience and I will guide people and give my input and they will choose when they feel they've had enough. When they've, you know, and if I say, look, you've gotten all the benefit you need to get, or we've set into motion all the things that need to be set into motion or whatever that might be. Um, I find that the recovery from a fast is so valuable that I would rather, even though it's a pain, I would much rather see people fast shorter and recover longer than the other way around. I've had fasting supervisors tell me, look, people come to fast. The longer they fast with me, the better it is for them. The most they can get out of this fast. Right? And I'm going, no. My goal for fasting for each individual is to make the fast as long as necessary, but as short as possible. I've, I've never had to fast anybody with arthritis longer than 30 days. And these were people who were crippled to the point of 100% bedridden. But people who just had arthritis where they couldn't grip a pair of scissors well, or they couldn't hold on to their car keys because their thumbs hurt. Uh, these fasts are typically shorter than three weeks. And we've done the job. At that point, why fast any longer than necessary? 
You don't really need to do that. And there's no benefit to be gained. I'd rather show people how to eat well, how to make friends with fruits and vegetables, how to make the recipes that they perhaps don't know how to make, if it's sauces or, or certain foods that they want to, you know, be able to put together. I'd rather show them how, you know, if you fast for 50 days, um, it's, it's still such a small percentage of your life. Like I'd much rather put emphasis on let's learn how to live healthfully and make the fast just a small intervention. Nice. Nice. I love that answer. Well, thank you. Um, then we have another question. What is the best water to be uh, to be consumed during the fast and in general? Okay, I saw this question and and it's an interesting question because there are various answers that people will give. Okay. So I personally almost never drink water. <coughs> I, I, I really almost never drink. In the height of summer, if I'm doing something really tough, obviously if I'm thirsty, I'll drink. I have nothing against drinking water. But I find that, you know, I stay very well hydrated. Um, I go to the bathroom enough times per day, so I'm not at all concerned about my hydration levels. Uh, and I don't eat anything that makes me thirsty. And so I find I just rarely even drink a few sips of water. How important is it to me what kind of water I drink? If I only drink a gallon a year, if I only drink four liters a year, how much does it matter? But the people who are drinking four liters a day, they better be darn sure that they drink a high quality water. And a high quality water is water that um, has hydrogen and oxygen and as close to nothing else as possible there's various ways to make such water if what you were drinking was cold marina and i don't know that it is but if what you were drinking was cold water would form on the outside of the glass that's called condensation and condensated water very well likely may be the cleanest water in the world. It's awesome. There are machines that make condensated water and I've drank that water and it's, it's miraculous. It's really good. Second best close to that, certainly on a par with that, is distilled water, which is water that's been evaporated and then condensed, right? It's, and, and then or cooled until it changes form from, from vapor back to water. And that's a, that's a cool process. What that does is it it leaves things behind that were in the water or boils things off before the water warms up. Some things, some things evaporate at lower temperatures than water. And what a good distiller will do is it'll, it'll get rid of the impurities both before and after the boiling temperature of water. So it'll leave some things behind and some things will come out in advance. In, in vapor form. So distilled water is really clean, but the technology for reverse osmosis has gotten so good uh, that you can, you can, I would have no qualms drink. If I was drinking four liters a day, I'd have no qualms drinking reverse osmosis water. That's still very clean water. 
Um, as the expression goes, the crap from the tap. I wouldn't recommend or or touch that unless it was an emergency state, and I was only I only needed a few swallows just to get past some emergency. I wouldn't drink tap water. I know it's in it. Every impurity known to man, every drug that any humans ever taken. Um, goodness knows, chemicals of all sorts are added to it. Uh, fish pooped in that water. You know, I mean, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm not going to say tap water. Some people think mineral water is good. Obviously, when you're making distilled water or condensated water and even RO water, the whole point is taking out all of those minerals because those minerals are inorganic minerals. It's basically sand. It's what eggshells are made of. It's what kidney stones are made of. It's what hardening of the arteries is made of. It's what arthritis is made of. It's what, it's what, what's that thing they call it when you forget stuff? Oh yeah. Old timers disease, you know, and, 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 <laughs> you know, there's two, there's, there's two symptoms of old timers disease. One is forgetfulness. And I can't remember the other. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. So distilled water. And some people teach that the inorganic minerals in water that is not distilled are important because they are electrolytes that uh, conduct electricity in between cells. Okay. So first of all, most of the, most of the minerals that are in, in water aren't electrolytic minerals. I mean, we're not talking about potassium and sodium, which are the two major electrolytic minerals. Uh, but we're also getting all of the electrolytes we need from our fruits and vegetables. We don't need to get it from water. Uh, there's, there's no one on a fruit and vegetable diet that's running into an electrolyte shortage. I mean, I, I've never once heard of that happening. So it's a moot point. Okay, and they are, and it is not a conductor, and those inorganic minerals from water are not a conductor of electricity in between cells? Well, if they're electrolytic minerals, they can be. We have to remember there's, there's roughly... Mm -hmm. 14 electrolytic minerals. Okay. But there's a lot of minerals that aren't. Most minerals are not electrolytic. Oh. But there's only but there's only two primary electrolyte minerals. Potassium, so potassium. and sodium. Fruits and okay. veggies. Fruits and veggies. And then and then outside of sodium and potassium, there's only four other pluses and four other minuses but on the on the minus side there's also I, I believe five other minerals besides that so you end up with 14 altogether and that's all the electrolytic minerals there are but most of them are very very minor in small quantities uh, and we certainly don't need to get them from our water as we say there's I mean there there's also this there's other kinds of water. There's like charged water where, where people intentionally um, raise the pH of the water. And again, I see no point in that. We're not looking for water with a pH value above zero. I'm sorry, above seven at absolute neutral. We want absolute neutral. And the way we know that is because And this may come as a surprise. I hold the intensive care unit in hospitals in very high regard. They're working with people who are so critical that they can't afford, the carers cannot afford to make an error or they lose the client. They lose the patient. And in a hospital setting such as that, Distilled water is what goes into people's arms. So 
Oh, and sodium and potassium. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's a, so, and that's a perfect sport to drink. Yeah. And so um, this is a good indication that pH neutral, 7.0, which is what hospital distilled water is, 7.0, is appropriate for human beings. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. So there is no point in going to um, uh, these uh, charged waters and uh, mineral rich water, for example, water that is enriched with magnesium for brain work, <laughs> brain functions, and so on. Nonsense and silver you know, water and so on. better for us than mm -hmm. the amount we need. That's the right. We need we get from our food. And and talking about that, like they enrich water, but with what kind of uh, minerals with inorganic we need organic minerals right and those are just in the structure of fruits and vegetables so I mean, you might as well eat eggshells <laughs> or sand okay yeah, sand. yeah so that that would be fun um could fasting reverse kidney cysts well let's let's be clear here that that fasting doesn't do anything the body does Okay, the body's doing everything. And in the same way that if you start breaking your front garden a little every day, you're going to develop calluses on your hands. In the same way that your body can make those calluses, you will lose those calluses if you stop breaking every day. The same way that you can build muscular endurance by doing certain things in the endurance range of activity, you can lose that muscular endurance by not doing those things. Your body can create cysts, primarily doing so because of the consumption of what are called tumorigens. Tumorigens are the substances, the chemicals that foster the development by the body of tumors and cysts. And tumorigens are found in all cooked food, all. Obviously, the degree to cooking, the type of cooking affects how much, but Tumorigens are found in cooked food. End of story. Uh, in the same way that the body can create such tumors, uh, cysts, and whatnot, we can certainly resorb and eliminate any anything that the body can make, it can unmake. Yes. Wow. It's so miraculous when somebody talks about uh, about the, the miraculous healing properties of body in that way. As you know, I, among other schools, graduated from the secondary medical school. I had two majors simultaneously and none, not in one subject did we talk about the miraculous healing properties of body, not in one. And that's... Well, it's pretty it's, fascinating, right? I mean, if you cut yourself, it heals. It's nothing you did. In fact, if a sturgeon cuts you, he doesn't, <laughs> he puts you back together, but your body heals itself. We yes. rely on the body healing itself. This is forest for trees. This is so obvious. It's so common that we stop seeing it. Mm -hmm. But we rely on the body to heal itself. And it always does which is why you go to bed at night tired and wake up in the morning and you feel refreshed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's so true. Uh, during our fasting retreat, I am going to be the one who is going to measure vital signs of the fasters primarily. And if we're going to have anyone else on the site with us, as I said, if anyone wants to intern with us, we have an internship program. And in that internship program, you're going to live with us on the site, learn about fasting, learn about how to take care of the fasters. You will also uh, taking vital signs of the fasters and learn about how to take care of them. Uh, so anyway, 
but for now, it is me who is going to take uh, care of the fasters. And I do have some medical training in my background. And last year, after I finished my uh, my fast of 21 days, supervised water fast in Costa Rica, I uh, helped, I assist running to fasting retreats and back in 2013 i was interning with you at your amazing internship program in costa rica which was really uh, a game changer for me in so many ways in the way how i see life and health and i i came from medical background onto into your retreat and it was like boom like a explosion in my mind and with all the re- uh, prerequisite literature that i had to, to read shelton and so on it was really uh s- such a big game changer in my life so thank you for that so anyway i'm going to be the one for now and uh, hopefully uh interns who are going to sh- uh, to to uh to join us you're all welcome so just dm me for the link for internship program uh uh, last year, uh, the vital signs that I was measuring were uh, 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 blood pressure, temperature, um, uh, what else, uh, and then body fat um, uh, uh, and uh, and weight, and uh, how many times somebody peed during um, urinated, sorry, <laughs> urinated <laughs> during twenty four hours, uh, and how many hours they slept. And uh, and that's probably it. Is there anything else that we are going to measure? And somebody asked, are we yeah, measuring I'll, I'll hydration? For you. Thank oh, you. thank I you. I <laughs> have each person. Uh, I basically, I basically am taking a position of high responsibility, where people are handing me decision-making power about their own health. And it's a, it's a responsibility I take very seriously. So we will monitor people as closely as possible because I really don't like health problems to sneak up on me uh, without me being aware and seeing them coming. So most things come on people when they're fasting. Uh, we get some indicators that something isn't right. Uh, And maybe it's their respiratory weight, or maybe it's the color of their eyes, or maybe it's the way they're talking, or maybe it's their attitude. Maybe it's their grip strength, or maybe it's their posture. Uh, Maybe it's their skin feels clammy. There's a lot of things we'll watch, and and we'll keep track every day. And yes, you will do the monitoring, because that puts another pair of eyes on each person in addition to my own. We will then talk about each one of those people each day. Uh, and go through their uh, entire form so that if there's anything worthy of discussion, not only will I be aware of it, if you have concerns, you know, we'll discuss it so that it becomes an educational process, but it also lets us think through what's going on and what's the appropriate uh, next step, if you will, for each individual. Nice, nice. Are we yeah, measuring? I'll, I'll give you a full list of parameters. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fun. It's several pages. There's only four vital signs. But I, I know you like to keep me busy. Okay, I know you like to keep me busy, so no worries. Uh, in, in, are we going to measure hydration level of each person? We can't really measure hydration level. We monitor to some degree, how much they drink, but I'm much more concerned with what's coming out than just how much is going in. Uh, And this is easily done by urinary frequency. So that pretty much tells us all we need to know. Unless a person has an exceptionally large or small bladder, which is unusual. Most people, if they feel a full bladder, they're somewhere between four to 500 mil Mm -hmm. and that's the volume of an average person's urination nice so we know we know what they're what they're giving out if they say they urinated eight times we know it was close to four liters three and a half four liters Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay okay i see and based on that we can like suggest how much they should drink yeah yes for sure because urinary Mm -hmm. frequency goes down uh, water intake 
must go up. Yes, again. yes. Okay. We don't, so, but if it's much more than 12, eight, if it's much more than eight for a faster, down. Um, we're starting to get into that situation where we can dilute critical mineral volume, making it less effective. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to do that. And then they should lower the amount of water they drink. Yeah, because if they're if they're urinating 11 or 12 or 13 times in 24 hours and trying to rest, but having to get up 13 times a day uh, becomes inconvenient, mm -hmm. just plain inconvenient. It, there's, there's a, it's, it's different for someone who's eating. Absolutely, absolutely. Where, uh, whereas you've heard me say before, we're looking at eight to twelve as, as a more realistic recommendation range. Mm -hmm. But for fasters, I'm really not. I'm really looking more in the six to eight range. But is the speed of drinking water important as well? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't make a difference. Okay. And one last question, and this is not uh, really about fasting, but rather about um, uh, eating the 80 10, 10 diet because it, uh, it is a diet where most calories come from fruit. And uh, this person wants to know if somebody uh, already has a fatty liver and uh, has been eating a standard fatty diet their whole life. And now, now after a couple of decades, is it uh, is it safe for them to go straight to the 80 10 10 diet where most uh calories come from fruit? Because this person is afraid that all that sugar from fruit, even though it's in whole fruit, can damage uh, can be a burden to fatty liver. Okay, so <clears throat> overeating is always a problem. I'm not recommending anybody overeat on fruit or anything else. Uh, let's look at how you got that fatty liver, you didn't get it from eating uh, uh, fruit. <laughs> that should be that should be an indicator right there that should be pretty telling so no I've, I've never seen that become a problem we've seen a lot of people heal from fatty liver on 80 10 10 so uh, that's really not, really not an issue and I love when you say that uh, healthful living does not have contraindication none there's no contraindication to healthful living. Uh, interestingly enough, in the medical world, there are contraindications to healthful living. Oh, uh, yes. For yes. instance, if you're on, if you're on uh, anti-clotting factors and, and then you eat fruit and you become even less clotting, uh, it can be a problem. Or if you're on... If you're on anti-rejection meds and then you eat fruit and veg and become far more able to reject, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who have organ transplants are often told don't eat any fruits and vegetables. So in that world, yes, there are contraindications to healthful living, but for people who hope to be healthy, there's no contraindications to healthful living. Uh, I did see a question come in about organ regeneration. Yes, and, uh, Seva Tierra. Uh, I, I will say yes. That first of all, livers are constantly regenerating themselves uh, throughout our entire life. The liver continually regenerates itself. Um, and many organs, if partially damaged or partially removed, can regenerate themselves you've heard of people growing back tonsils for instance when they get cut out because they didn't get all of it and some and then it regenerated um, but a person who's born without a pancreas isn't likely to grow one later on in life uh, if that's what you're asking um, no i would say that's unlikely a person who donates a kidney um, isn't likely to regrow a kidney, um, I would say that is beyond what's called the limitation of matter. And you're not likely going to, you know, if your arm gets chopped off at the shoulder, you're probably not going to grow a new arm. It's, it's just beyond the limitation of matter. But if you cut your finger, it will heal. And that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. 
It is. It is. And for the very last uh, question, what is the most miraculous case or a couple of cases that you've seen during the years uh, of people healing uh, with fasting? Through fasting. The most miraculous? Mm -hmm. Well, well um, I saw a woman who, who couldn't move at all and hadn't moved for over a month because of crippling arthritis. Fifth 50 days later, she could go up and down flights of stairs by herself without using her arms on the railing at all. Uh, that was pretty miraculous. Uh, because not only was it a miraculous healing of the arthritis, but she hadn't moved. She hadn't gotten out of bed for four months in total, including a month of fasting. Um, and so in four months, you talk about some muscle wastage she was so weak at the end of four i saw an 80 an 80 year old woman who weighed um 36 kilos like a, a fairly slight 80 year old and she broke her femur at the at the hip joint and doctors refused to do any corrective surgery on her because um, her osteoporosis was so bad that they said in the recovery, she was going to catch pneumonia and die anyway. So don't worry about her. Uh, they wrote her off. Uh, and she fasted for 21 days. In fact, no, she fasted 18 days. She fasted 18 days. It's such a and small weight. Start, it's such a long weight. The refeeding process. And at the end of, at the end of 30 days, uh, she was walking on that hip. Her femur was completely healed. Uh, that's pretty miraculous on an 80 year old because bone healing is slowed the older we get and bone healing is slowed the further your osteoporosis has progressed. So she was not in a good state. Um, that was pretty miraculous to see. I, I, I've, I've watched people with with psoriasis so bad that they no longer went out in public, uh, completely heal in a less than three weeks of fasting. Um, I've watched, gosh, I've watched some people with, with post-traumatic stress disorder from having been systematically sexually abused for 10 years from ages six to 16, um, completely turn their life around and, and end up with a job where they interact with the public every single day, where before they couldn't even, they couldn't even talk on the telephone. Um, seen some, I mean, every structure and every function vectors towards health. So whether we're talking about mental health, emotional health, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I, I saw a man who's had both legs slated to be cut off because he had gangrene um, so bad that he was going to have both legs cut off at mid thigh. And he fasted um he fasted a full six weeks and then the next time i saw him he was playing soccer with his kids <laughs> what yeah had full full use of both legs completely healed watched that i watched those wounds heal um yeah just endless endless tumors disappear um Arthritis disappear. People with serious heart malfunctions completely after a fast. Um, some pretty cool stuff. Lots and lots and lots. It could go on for a long time with that one. Wow, that's just miraculous. I'm just sorry. Now I'm sorry that this wasn't the first question because this part was just miraculous as well. <laughs> I, I can tell you a hundred of them off the top of my head and every single one of them, they're just, 
I mean, yeah. Well, we'll people, definitely have a month. So, I mean, crippled with peripheral neuropathy, um, crippled with ulcerative colitis, slated. Uh, I had a guy who slated to have his entire colon removed. His entire large intestine was was going to be removed. Um, he he was going to get a bag on his on his hip instead, and. Um, oh. And he fasted. He fasted a long fast. He did uh, forty-two days to overcome that. But he he became perfectly healthy after that. And this is a young man. He's only twenty-three. Um, I had a man. I had a man fast with throat cancer, a tumor big enough that he could barely talk. Uh, and he fasted and, and oddly enough, he was a, he was a reverend. So he, you know, he needed to talk and, and he fasted, um, until there was complete resolve of throat cancer. So it's kind of, yeah, all sorts of things. Wow. It's so miraculous. The body heals itself. That's what it does. I mean, we take this for granted. But it's doing that 24 seven all the time. And it's just a matter of how much are we willing to get in the way or out of the way of allowing our perfect miraculous body to do what it does best. Nice. Which is just, just keep plugging along. And thank you. Thank you for sharing all these stories with us. It, uh, it's sure. just miraculous and inspiring to hear about all we these. We should do it again sometime. Absolutely. Tomorrow in Serbian. Well, actually, uh, you, you're going to learn Serbian until tomorrow, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Doug, for this beautiful conversation. I enjoyed it immensely. And thank you, everyone who uh, were here with us uh, tonight. And as I said, if you would like to fast at our next fasting retreat, uh, which be uh, begins on the 15th of June in my home country of Serbia, we have all set up for you beautiful accommodation professionals supervision and the best care that uh, you can find here um, will be more than happy to host you and uh, and uh, give you um, good care for your healing. And if you're not interested in fasting, but would you, you would like to live with us, eat the 80 10, 10 diet, exercise and learn about fasting, natural hygiene and health, then just DM me for the link. And if you want to fast, there is a link here in the story as well as my EG bio. Until the next time, I'm wishing you all the best and have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Doug.